Hare Krishna. So today we come to the last session on this uh, understanding the unborn's understandings. And for me personally, this section was the most difficult to understand. Some of the sections were like, what I had talked in the previous sessions. How can an unborn child have consciousness enough to, to pray, to speak prayers? That does require some philosophical, that requires some scientific reconciliation of science and philosophy. But this question for me was devotionally challenging. Why? Because the child is fervently praying that, my dear Lord, I don't want to fall in illusion. Let me stay in misery. But I want to stay in the womb. And what happens? He still falls into illusion. He, despite offering such heartfelt prayers, amid such distress, it seems as if the prayer is not answered. It seems, despite the prayers, that the soul again falls into illusion. The soul is put in a situation where again illusion is thrust on it. So is the Lord not answering the prayer? So I have asked many senior devotees about this and I have got some understanding which I will try to share today. So basically, <coughs> devotion can, they can have three broad aspects. There is situation, action, and intention. So, when we have no alternative, and then we surrender to God, that is good, but that is not really love. That's, that's helplessness. It's good, at least we are turning toward God, but that is not really love. It's like, say, uh, if a boy proposes to a girl, please marry me. Now, if the girl, why do you want to marry me? Imagine the boy says, actually nobody else is ready to marry me, so you please marry me. Well, that is not going to be a very appealing proposal. Uh, the girl wants to know, you find me attractive. You want to be with me, not because I was your last alternative and nothing else works, so you came to me. So similarly, if nothing else works and we turn toward God, it's good that we are turning toward Him, but that is not really serious, it's not really love. So what I talked about, situation, action and intention. So when the situation is helpless and that time we turn toward God, it is good, but that is not yet love. So what is required for us to connect with Krishna is the intention. And of course there is intention here also, but the intention is more based on one's own inner inclination, one's own inner attraction. So what is happening to the child in the womb over here is that the child is based on situation because of utter helplessness turning towards God. And again that is good. In helplessness, so many people can turn towards so many other things. And they do. They turn towards drugs, they turn towards alcoholism, they turn towards violence, they turn towards suicide. They, we could say the embryo is helpless and can't do any of these odd things. That's okay. But still, it's turning toward God. That's credible. That's, that's praiseworthy. But still, that's not enough. So, what... So, real devotion, or see, our devotion is tested... Also, when we have options and yet we choose Krishna. Not because we have no options and so we choose Krishna. You know, so, when, so it's not that the Lord is not answering the prayer. Rather, just by offering that prayer, by being absorbed in the remembrance of the Lord, the soul gets some solace. The soul gets some relief. That, that, oh, that the Lord is with me, I can turn towards Him. All this suffering which I am going through, there is a purpose. It can raise me to higher consciousness. And the soul is raised to higher consciousness. But there is situational turning toward Krishna and there is international, intentional turning toward Krishna. I talked in one of my earlier classes about three, three ways of practicing devotion. There is circumstantial devotion or situational devotion. Then intentional devotion. And then, then there is spontaneous devotion. So, circumstantial devotion is 
what is being exhibited by the child in the womb over here and uh, it's good when circumstantial devotion is there but then if we want to personally develop a relationship with krishna we have to consciously choose him even when we have options and that is intentional devotion intentional devotion is usually practiced with our intelligence circumstantial devotion is practiced simply because of helplessness so by the practice of intentional devotion steadily we become purified and when we become purified then eventually from spontaneous through intentional we come to sorry from circumstantial through intentional we come to spontaneous devotion and spontaneous devotion is what is the characteristic of the pure devotees spontaneous devotion is the basis of an eternal ecstatic relationship with krishna we always have an eternal relationship with krishna but right now it might be more of a discipline than ecstasy but when we are spontaneously attracted to krishna as the vrajavasis are then that is the purpose and perfection of life so we need to come to that level of spontaneous devotion and before that we have to practice intentional devotion so the, so it's not the lord has not answered the prayers rather the lord has accepted see it's a, from situational devotion to in, uh, intentional devotion that is also a progression and that progression requires a certain amount of graduation is like if a student is going from say high school to college now when the student is going from high school to college that means the student was successful in high school that's how they go to college university depending on what words are used so similarly the soul is not that the soul is abandoned by krishna rather the soul is now given an opportunity to be helped to 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 be helped to make a free choice and it is that free choice in the presence of other options that at uh, the free choice of krishna that indicates our seriousness of devotion the purpose of this section is important to understand everywhere in bhagavatam the narrative is told with a particular purpose sometimes we are hearing a class and the speaker starts telling some story and sometimes if they're not very coherent then while we are hearing the story we might be entertained but still we are also puzzled why is the story being told what is the point of this so it is important not just to hear the point it not, not to look for the point it is also important to look for the point of the point what is the point of saying this point so here the principle the purpose of this section in the bhagavatam is not primarily uh, to demonstrate it is primarily to demonstrate how misery is there throughout all of existence and that's why the prabhupad says in his purport that even in the womb there is misery to come out of the womb there is misery throughout life there is misery and it's not that at death misery will end it will continue even after that now of course many people find this a very pessimistic message so it just needs to be phrased appropriately if you if you say the world is a place of misery it just seems so cold so oh, pessimistic but if you just phrase it in a different way you say life is tough everybody yeah life is tough when we say life is tough we are actually stressing we're saying the same point but what is the, what we are doing is it seems empathic yeah like yeah, we, all, we all find life is tough but the world is a place of misery that makes it seem as if it's just a philosophy of ideology of hopelessness because for most people there is no conception of any world beyond this world so that is one of the defining differences between the pre modern and the modern times in the pre modern times whether it is india whether it is uh, native america whether it is europe whether it is the middle east everybody had an understanding that there is a world beyond this world and this world is just a place of journey from here you go to the next world 
but now that idea has been largely removed from the world view of most people and that's why if you say this world is a place of misery then we feel that its existence itself is misery and that's all there is to it so it seems very pessimistic but it is phrased in like this stuff yeah you feel empathy yeah my life is tough your life is tough everyone's life is tough so this the uh, the same philosophical points we present appropriately then people can then we can relate with people so the point of the section is to tell us how life is stuck throughout don't have any illusions that life is wonderful now if we see the context within specifically within the bhagavatam at one level it is kapila dev who is speaking speaking to devahuti and life is tough for her also she is a princess born in royalty and comfort and then she was married to a sage and she served him with great austerity for a long time and then just after finally when her austerity was rewarded her husband at least noticed all that she was doing and wanted to reward her her husband gave her a son and immediately left she could have felt forsaken and now her son who is the only person for her in her life he's also going to leave so of course there was a kapila was living in an ashram and they were just like sita lived in valmiki's ashram with other um, female hermits so like that devahuti was taken care of but the point was it was terrible her husband had gone now her, her son was going to leave her and go away so kapila is telling this whole incident or this whole analysis to show that actually it's not just you who are suffering life is tough for everyone one of the easiest ways or one of the commonest ways the mind gets us is by getting us alone it makes us feel nobody is suffering the way i am suffering and that's how it it makes us feel negative feel hopeless it is just the a perverted sense of ego i want to be great positively doing wonderful things or if not then the mind wants to be great by talking about how greatly dreadful things are happening to me but if you talk with anyone if people open their heart you'll find that everybody has gone through such distresses in life gone through them sometimes people behave badly with us now if we actually uh, talked with them and knew where they were coming from then they were shocked at how terrible people are but if we came to know what all they have gone through we wouldn't be shocked how terrible they are we would be surprised why they are not worse than what they are actually life is terrible and it is it is a testimony to human character that not everybody becomes degenerated because of life's unfairness it's so easy to become bitter to res- become resentful to become violent either violent toward the world or violent toward oneself in terms of taking up self destructive habits so the stress of this section is life is tough and now we see this in a in a bigger context chukdev goswami is speaking to parishit maharaj and life was tough for him also terrible or little or no fault he was sentenced to die so now if we see the parallels parikshit maharaj also prayed in the mother's womb but in his context it was somewhat different in his context what had happened was while he was in his mother's womb ashwatthama had sent a deadly weapon and that weapon the acharya described actually killed parikshit but the lord intervened with the sudarshan chakra and drove away the brahmastra and revived parikshit so that encounter with the divine which parikshit had is similar somewhat to the encounter with the divine which this child in the womb has the similarity is that there was an encounter with the divine the difference is that there there was external danger from which the divine intervened and protected 
but in this case there is just internal misery but we see that with respect to the lord's protection the way the lord protects is often mysterious yesterday i talked about these four quadrants now comfort and spirituality no comfort no spirituality comfort no spirituality spirituality no comfort and spirituality and comfort so it's best to be sustainably situ for to be sustainably situated we have a reasonable degree of comfort and we are spiritual uh, sometimes we are put in the situation of there is no comfort but we can be the spiritual or we can sink towards utter misery so this uh, four quadrants if you want to say first is simply miserable no sp no comfort no spirituality then if you have comfort but no spirituality it is like comfortably miserable person is imagining they are happy then the third quadrant would be where there they are hmm, where there is no comfort but spirituality that is transcendently absorbed and here you could say there is comfort and spirituality that is productively absorbed there is too much misery we can just transcend the world we could say our productively are transformationally absorbed our spirituality has two aspects to it transcending the world and transforming the world so transcending the world means yeah, this world is a place of distress we just have to raise our consciousness beyond this world and get out but that's not the only aspect of spirituality it transcending the world is what is talked about in 49 in the bhagavad gita janma karma chame divya but transforming the world is also talked about in the previous verse for it dharma samsthapana thaya sambhavami yuge so shri prabhupada established the krishna consciousness movement for both purposes during our morning sadhana during our classes during our chanting we are transcending the world raising our consciousness above the world but during the rest of the day we are doing various practical services so that time we are engaged with the world we go into the world and that is for transforming the world so both are required transcending and transforming so you so you should if the misery is too much the if we are in a situation of no comfort and spirituality then we can't do anything to transform the world say if we are in sick and in great pain we can't do any practical service all that we can do is maybe chant krishna's names or get some of mind somehow absorb in him and try to transcend the pain so if we are to be productively engaged in the world then we have to be more or less in the fourth quadrant then we can be transformationally absorbed in krishna here we need to be we be transcendentally absorbed so often when we are in danger so we see here i am trying to draw a parallel between parishit maharaj's condition and the child in the home's condition so parishit maharaj was protected in the mother's womb but now this curse has come upon him and if we see as the bhagavatam flow will go on what will happen is parikshit was cursed to die in 7 days and after 7 days he dies and he say where is the protection where is the protection see the protection was that he did not go into the first quarter <coughs> krishna the first pattern of no comfort and no spirituality because of the curse is comfort what is because comfort is life itself was going to be taken away from him but krishna gave him the resources through shukadeva goswami's presence through all the sages presence to become absorbed in krishna and when the lord apparently doesn't answer our prayer or the lord doesn't protect us it just means that the lord in that situation wants us to become transcendently absorbed not so much transformationally absorbed it happened so many times chilapa prabhupa tried something and it just didn't work and prabhupa just accepted that and moved on okay just this is how life is sometimes things don't work move on of course eventually krishna arranged that things worked in extraordinary ways for chilapa prabhupa and that's how in 10 11 years he was able to do it. unparalleled outreach work but eventually he did fall sick and although he was chanting devotees all over the world and thousands millions were praying for him for his recovery uh, but eventually 
the body ran its own course and Prabhupada became transcendentally absorbed. So throughout his life, sometimes Prabhupada was transformationally absorbed where he had the com the word comforts might be a little negative, but comfort I'm using the word of sense of resources, the necessary resources for functioning. So Prabhupada had the resources, Prabhupada had health, he had a, he had a disciples, he had wealth, he was building temples, traveling across the world, doing extraordinary transformational spiritual work. But when it was not there, the, when the basic resource, that health was taken away, it was not that Krishna was not answering prayers. Prabhupada was absorbed in Krishna. And that very absorption was the proof of his devotion. You know, one evidence of his devotion was that he was traveling across the world even in his old age and sharing Krishna consciousness constantly. And not only just constantly, but potently. It was bringing about transformation in his hearts. Extraordinary, unprecedented transformation. But then when his body fell apart, then his absorption in Krishna was also the evidence of his devotion, his exalted devotion. So sometimes when Krishna doesn't answer our prayers, it doesn't mean that he is rejecting us. It just means that it, it, it now what it specifically means, it is very difficult to know. We may have to pray, seek guidance. And maybe after the pa passage of time, we may realize. But we can know that Krishna is always with us. And Krishna is always there to answer every prayer. The answer he gives may sometimes be such that it may be different from what we what we are looking for. So one, I'll conclude with this point and then I'll summarize. I wanted to give a full picture of all that we have spoken in the five classes. And then you can have questions. Now surrender has many aspects to it. One, one essential aspect of devotion is surrender. And one, one essential aspect of surrender is surrender of expectations. As a, to, to be conscious beings means we all have expectations. If we speak politely with someone, we expect that the other person should speak politely with us. And that person speaks rudely. We're taken aback. What happened? So in a sense, in everything that we do, we have expectations. In every relationship, there are expectations. But the problem comes when the relationship becomes conditional to the expectations. It's like parents naturally will have expectations of children. But when the parents go to their adolescence, yeah, their teens, their turbulent teens, then now the children may not... They are dealing with their own issues, their hormones are rising, their peers are pressurizing them. They are trying to find out their own identity. And at that time they may not respond the way the earlier they were doing. And the parents may say, what is this? If the parents become very judgmental, unloving, critical, then the child will just become extremely lonely. So parents will naturally have expectations. Now, whether the child does the right, their, their children do the right thing or, or they don't do the right thing. But the relationship, especially if it's a committed relationship like that, it is. It has to be there irrespective of expectations are fulfilled or not. So for one aspect, the same principle applies much more to our relationship with Krishna. That surrender means surrender of expectations also. That when I surrender to Krishna, I may say it's natural, I'm surrendering, I expect protection from you. Yes, but the way in which the protection may come. We can't demand from Krishna that this is how you need to protect me. And if you don't protect me this way, then you don't exist or you don't care. That, that kind of demanding attitude is not, not really devotion. Prabhupada says in a third canto per fourth that a devotee always desires to see the Lord, but a devotee doesn't demand to see the Lord. Who wouldn't want desire to have the personal darshan of the Lord? But if you start demanding, that is not devotion. So, and if you are not desiring, again, then where is the relationship? Where is the devotion? We obviously have to have desire. So, naturally, when we are in danger, we will desire protection. We will expect protection. But desiring or expecting, but not demanding. That is the mood of devotion. That is the mood of surrendered devotion. So, inside the womb, amid situation, the child turned towards the Lord. 
and that is good that the child has at least turned towards the Lord. But when the child comes out of the womb, it is the responsibility of society, of the parents, of the rulers, of the spiritual leaders, of the teachers, to help the child again turn towards the Lord. And that is why, that is the mood of the Bhagavatam saying that one should not become a spiritual master or a teacher or a parent unless one can deliver one's dependence. Guru Nasasyat. Hmm. If you cannot deliver. So it's, it's not the Lord accepts the prayer and the Lord helps the child to transcend the pain of that situation. But we shouldn't expect that just because of our devotion, Krishna will change the rules of the game. The rules of the game are, this world is a place of distress. Just because we are devotees doesn't mean we will not grow old. If, um, if we are naive, then people will manipulate and exploit us. It's because say, I was doing it for Krishna. Well, okay, you are doing it for Krishna. But one part of doing it for Krishna is for doing it responsibly, doing it expertly. If you are careless about handling money and somebody steals it, and say, you know, I'm doing it for Krishna. Krishna should have protected it. Well, no, it's not that Krishna has to protect it. It's not that devotion means we expect Krishna to change the rules of the game for us. Krishna can guide and empower us to play the game better. But to and Krishna can sometimes change the rules of the game also. But that is not the primary mood of the Bhagavatam. If Krishna doesn't change the rule of the game for Parishit Maharaj in this stage. Your curse by a Brahmana, Brahmana's curses are almost un, un, you cannot counter them. So Krishna doesn't change the rule of the game. What Krishna does is Krishna helps us to raise, helps Parishit Maharaj to raise his consciousness above the situation. So a child in the womb, the natural the, uh, the course of the game, the rules of the game is that a child in the womb comes out. And when the child in the womb comes out, at that time, the child's consciousness will be rooted through the body. And the, because the body is very infantile, so naturally the child may not have any spiritual consciousness at that time. So that, just because the game is pro progressing according to the rules of the game, doesn't mean Krishna has forsaken us. So devotion, if we think that my devotion should lead to Krishna changing the rules of the game, that's an unrealistic expectation from Krishna. That, that can, Krishna can do it, but that's exceptional. And that is not the mood of a devotee. That devotee demand from Krishna that Krishna change the rules of the game for me. There is a story in the Bible that uh, the devil tempts Jesus. And Jesus says, God will always protect me. So there he has gone on top of a mountain cave to meditate. And the devil tells Jesus, okay, jump down from here. Let's see if your God protects you. He says, I will not jump down. If you push me down, then God will protect me. It is not that I will do something foolish and then I demand that God protects me. No, that is not the way. We have to act in a, with as much responsibility and intelligence as we have. And if sometimes something goes wrong, Krishna will protect us. But we don't, ex we don't demand that Krishna change the rules of the game for us. So Krishna's protection comes in different ways. And here the protection came in the form of the, the soul being transcendentally absorbed even amid great pain. And the soul comes out. It is the responsibility of those who are devoted to Krishna, the, the dharmic leaders of society, to provide the necessary facilities by which the soul can again be transformationally absorbed in Krishna and ultimately can attain Krishna. So I'll summarize what I spoke today, I spoke broadly on this theme of is the Lord not answering the prayer of the infant? That's not that way. What, the, what happens is the Lord is answering the prayer but in a way different from what we would expect. What the Lord does is the Lord answers the prayer by giving the child absorption. So here the child prays and still the child falls into falls out of the womb into ignorance. But that's just the natural course of events. So I talked about when we expect Krishna to answer our prayers, what, what are we actually expecting? So I talked about essentially when 
we, there, there are two ways of devotion it's transcendentally absorbed and transformationally absorbed so if there is basic comfort and resources then we can be transformationally absorbed in changing the world but otherwise when things don't change we have to be transcendentally absorbed and there is in there is situation action and intention so if situation forces us to do a devotional action that is good but that is not that is immature devotion because it's not voluntary so if we turn to krishna because we have no options that's good but best is we turn toward krishna even when we have options so the child has practiced circumstantial or situational devotion and that's good but now the child is allowed to come out into the world grow and have options and then society needs to provide the resources by which the child gets the intelligence and practices intentional devotion so intentional devotion is based not so much on situation as on our intention to practice bhakti and by intentional devotion we can rise to spontaneous devotion where we attain the lord and the purpose of this section is not primarily to demonstrate the lord's miraculous intervention in somebody's life at a external material level the immediate context of this section is to stress how the world is miserable for everyone so that is that's how kapila is consoling devahuti i tell you don't feel so sorry for yourself because life is tough for everyone and similarly shukdev goswami is consoling parikshit maharaj that oh, yes life is tough for you you are cursed to die but that's how it begins from the womb like that and then i talk about the parallel between parikshit and and um, this child in the womb both of them have an encounter with the divine parikshit is miraculously protected from a unnatural sudden danger uh, whereas the child is in a natural distress that is there in the womb the child is protected by the consciousness being raised above but then it might also seem that the child is falling out and the child is not being protected so parikshit maharaj also has the lord not protected him now when he's cursed to die yes he's protected not by bringing him to a back to a comfortable situation but by giving him the resource to rise in spirituality even in an uncomfortable situation that's the mood of the bhagavatam so we sometimes transcend the world by our sadhana and sometimes we seek to transform the world by our seva and sometimes when the resources for transforming the world are taken away from us and despite our prayers they are not being returned that doesn't mean krishna is not answering our prayers we have to surrender means surrender of expectations and instead of expecting the resources to transform the world we just seek the resources to transcend the world and that's what prabhu pad did toward the end of his life he just came absorbed in krishna and when we learn to practice devotion Uh, with the surrender of expectations then we will find that krishna is always there with us sometimes by giving us resources to transform the world and sometimes by giving us resources to transcend the world so in the big picture we had uh, five sessions and we discussed in the first session how can the child speak such prayers so we talked about how the consciousness of the soul doesn't have to dip, is actually downgraded by the presence of the body and the mind and the soul can act by non physical means so these prayers are offered although the brain is not developed because the consciousness is independent of the body and the brain and i talked about various examples of this out of that experiences gender dysphoria and so many things like that the second session was okay the child can speak uh, utter prayers but how can the child speak about god speak to god so you talked about how the soul has potentiality to um, has divine potentiality it is like the soil is fertile so this is the krishna prem every soul in any species has the potential to know god and that is what makes our existence ultimately meaningful we are all meant to evolve toward knowing and loving god and then i talked about the, what is the, what is special about a human soul so that is the co- the covering around the soul are lesser the body the body and the brain are more developed the mind is less 
the mind, the covering of the subtle body is such that there is pos possibility for perceiving spirituality. So, all living beings are driven by instinct, but we human beings can choose to regulate our instincts and seek something higher in life. So, dharma, the capacity to ask not just how, how to live, how to survive, how to eat, how to mate, but why to do all these things, why to live for, and why question asking is what human beings have the capacity for. And that question, ultimately when answered, can take us towards transcendence, towards the Lord. So we ask this why question, either when life becomes unbearable or when whatever we have sought and got is unfulfilling. We seek and don't get and life becomes unbearable. We seek and get and life I mean, it turns out to be unfulfilling. That's often when we turn and ask, start asking the why questions. And in yesterday's class, I discussed about yes, we humans have the capacity to turn toward God, but when is that capacity activated? We talked about the relationship between spiritual development and material development. So the four quadrant approach. And most people feel critical about spirituality because they think that if I become spiritual, then I'll have to go into the first quadrant. That no nothing material, nothing spiritual, I'll just be miserable. And in science has led to progress in the second quadrant where we have material development but no spirituality. So, but for if you want to grow spiritually, for sustainable growth, we need to have basic material development, material resources, and then we can spiritually focus and grow. But sometimes we are in the fourth quadrant, we are in this lower quadrant where material comfort are taken away from us. And still we need to practice that devotion. So, distress itself does not produce devotion. It is the desire to turn toward Krishna that produces devotion. And in today's class, I discussed about how does the Lord not answer the prayers? He does. Sometimes by providing us resources for transforming the distressful situation and sometimes by providing resources for transcending that situation. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir. Okay. So, is this circumstantial some special mercy given by Krishna to the soul, whether the soul can offer prayers? It could be. In the first session, we had discussed this point about Prabhupada says some fortunate, some fortunate souls in the in the mother's womb make these prayers. So, what does that mean? That fortune could be, as you said, Lord, special intervention to give that realization. Or it could be some past spiritual grace, because of which, at that time, amid danger, that remembrance comes. But we see that spiritual, spiritual realization is, okay, let me put it this way, that our spiritual credits are eternal. But our conscious spiritual realizations, they can keep oscillating. That means whatever, if I want to turn toward Krishna, the attraction toward Krishna which I had developed in the past, that's always with me. With that I can turn toward Krishna. 
but whether i want, if i don't want to turn to krishna matta smritir gyanam apavanach and krishna can give, krishna can and will give me forgetfulness of my realization also so the so the potential the, the attraction to krishna that i have developed that is always there but whether i will remember all that that attracts me towards krishna at a particular time that will depend on whether i want to remember that when does krishna give us remembrance of forgetfulness it depends on how we are desiring things so uh, if the soul doesn't have that desire the soul desire something else then the spiritual realization can circumstantially go away and the circumstance can last for maybe a few minutes sometimes it can be for for a few years so we see dhruva maharaj had darshan of the lord and yet when the yakshas killed his brother uh, you could say even he was not particularly attached to his brother also this was a brother for whom his father had neglected him so the brother he could have said this is the brother because of which i was insulted but if that very brother of course later on the the wounds were healed and they were happily together but when that brother was killed the parishit maharaj became so angry that he started indiscriminately killing all the yakshas and then higher beings had to come and tell him stop so now if somebody has had darshan of the lord what more realization can you ask for but then it seems that he forgets temporarily so we see that priyavrat has is already renounced and it is with, with a mood of service that he enters into the household life to rule the world but then again he gets entangled he gets attached of course he comes out of it eventually but the point here is that uh there is no insurance to prevent future fall down based on our present status the only insurance is that we make a consistent habit of turning toward krishna in the present and that habit will be our momentum so if repeatedly i keep turning toward krishna again and again and again then in the future also it's likely that i'll turn toward krishna now what there is a insurance for is that if we turn away from krishna we will come back because nothing else once we have tasted krishna nothing else will be fulfilling enough and eventually we will get get uh, disappointed frustrated and turn toward krishna but how long we stay turned away from krishna that will depend upon how stubbornly we want to explore something else so so that sense the free will is always there with us so it it could be the child's uh, the lord special mercy by which the child is able to remember it could be some past by spirit cadets by which the child is able to remember amid the difficulty and we see there this happens sudden transition uh, in people's spiritual inclinations is chitraketu chitraketu as utrasur is suddenly fighting is is actually fighting fiercely and suddenly at one point first he says i will just you know you are the killer of your brother you are the you are the killer of my brother you are the killer of your guru you are the killer of a brahmana o oh, indra i will kill you and then i will offer water to my brother and i'll be satisfied then he's like when he very kshatriya mood suddenly his mood changes and he says if however you kill me today then i will offer this body to uh, to mukunda and i will give up this material existence and then suddenly he starts offering his transcendental prayers so what has happened over there he had a spiritual inclination but when as long as he is in the rakshasa body that rakshasa uh, course of mental rakshasa mentality was going on but then at, at a particular time the recollection came up so now is this situational well it is of course the recollection came from the situation but that situation was not the sole thing he already had his credits and they were just awakened and then he became completely absorbed in the lord and then he left his body he attained the lord so sometimes situations can obscure even those who are very spiritually advanced because we live in the material world and material consciousness can can easily overwhelm us in the first canto purport prabhupad says uh, the self realized soul is always alert no this is not self realized the liberated soul is always alert to avoid being entangled by material illusion now when i read it it struck me 
So if you are already liberated, why do you need to be alert? Isn't it? It's we who are conditioned. We need to be alert that we don't get caught by a condition. But liberated doesn't mean that uh, that they don't even sense illusion. Liberated means they recognize how dangerous illusion is, and they are alert to not be not succumb to it. Okay. Yes, I agree with that. That's all. See, the body and the soul are two distinct things. And the kind of body we have, that will express itself in some ways. There was a prominent Hindu leader, a Hindu Janasangha leader. He told Prabhupada once, Giraj Maharaj told me this past time that. And he said, Swamiji, you speak verses in a very Bengali way. You pronounce verses in a Bengali way. And Prabhupada said, what can I do? I'm Bengali. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're very nonchalant about it. I'm Bengali. So, although he's a soul, he's from the spiritual world, but his body is, is born and brought up in Bengal. So his pronunciation will be Bengali. You cannot expect Prabhupada to speak his English. It was 1920-30 English. That's what he learned in the school. He's not going to speak 21st century English. So, the body will affect the expression of devotion, even of pure devotees. But if somebody's soul is temporarily covered, then it will affect even more. So, so the, the body is meant to be a channel for expressing one's devotion. But then the expression devotion will be expressed according to the channel. And if the body is demoniac, then unless the soul is extraordinarily evolved, then there might be some demonic actions till the point that transformative movement comes up where one recollects the past. So that's what I said, Bali Maharaj, he seems to first want to fight against the, the Indra and take over his throne and he also wants to, when he's giving charity also, he's thinking primarily in terms of, I am a Kshatriya who will honor my word. He's not thinking, I, this is Vishnu and out of my devotion to him I'm giving. That move comes later. After he's bound and he's lost everything, then he says, I do not, I give my everything to you. So, it's the Kshatriya nature which is initially coming and he acts according to that. But eventually, the Kshatriya nature is, is transcended by the by the devotional devotional impression, the devotional inclination, the devotional nature. So there is this dynamic of both. Sometimes our conditioned nature becomes the channel by which we express our devotion. Sometimes conditioned nature obscures our devotion. And sometimes, rarely, we our devotion transcends our conditioned nature and we act accordingly. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Okay. How can one run up the intelligence to inquire and seek guidance in life when we have options and aren't with any trying circumstance? Rather than only seeking guidance only when we are in a difficult situation, seeing no other way to turn, how does one acquire this intentional surrender? Okay, good question. Thank you. So, when we have options, then how can we develop the intelligence to still seek guidance and turn toward Krishna rather than only seeking guidance when we are in trouble? There are two different aspects here. One is the idea of being in the guidance of someone. The other is also Srila Prabhupada wanted us to be independently thoughtful. Not independent, but independently thoughtful. That means while we always should feel dependence on devotees, dependence on our spiritual guides, dependence on Krishna. But that dependence 
should be more of a spiritual dependence it shouldn't be emotional dependence or even intellectual dependence why what do i mean by this emotional dependence means that oh if if my spiritual if my spiritual guide spiritual mentor spiritual master don't talk doesn't talk with me and smile at me doesn't uh, speak kind words to me i feel as if i'm alone and bereft and my spiritual life is useless that kind of emotional dependence will lead to too much emotional neediness and intellectual dependence means that we are constantly for every decision we don't do it we just we just keep asking keep asking Prabhupada often said Krishna consciousness is also common sense. So we need to use our common sense and we also need to take our decisions. But with respect to major decisions in our life, we need to be able, we need to have authorities whom we consult. Uh, so on one side, we need to develop, uh, we need, we, we want spiritual dependence, but not just intellectual dependence. See, but some people think that surrender means to outsource your thinking to your spiritual master <laughs> that i that's what i remember one devotee told me he says i love krishna consciousness says, why he says i don't have to think i just have to obey uh-huh. really that's what you love about it well i am not very comfortable with that answer the life is complex and to take intellectual responsibility for finding a right path it's 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 demanding and more many people would just prefer a formula you know do this do this do this and your life is perfect but life doesn't have a formula like that even in the bhagavatam if we see even when krishna is directly present in front of arjuna it's not that krishna always guides arjuna when ashwatthama is to be punished there are two parties right as arjuna there is bhima who is saying punish him and draupadi and uh, adisha saying let's forgive him Now Krishna doesn't tell Arjuna what to do. Krishna lets Arjuna decide based on the principles, by his understanding of that. Then of course Krishna ratifies the decision. But the point is that we don't want, we don't, uh, rather than seeking specific guidance for each situation in life, which we just can't get because everybody is busy, everybody's life is different. But it's. it is more of studying scripture regularly with devotees and by that we develop our own inner compass so it's it's the, to become to live according to scripture is more that is not so much each time asking question asking guidance for every small thing from somebody who is a spiritual guide who is teaching a scripture but rather primarily learning scripture from them and letting that scriptural knowledge seep into us so that it shapes our inner compass and with that inner compass we take decisions so of course when we have major decisions to take we should always seek guidance uh, but uh, in general if if we consider there are things which we know we should do and there are things which we know we should not do so if we do the things which we want, we are meant to do and if we avoid the things which we are not meant to do then by that we are showing krishna that we want to live according to his guidance and then dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam payanti te he will give us the guidance from within more and more so prabhupad says in the nectar of instruction purport uh, introduction purport he says that if one comes to the mode of goodness then how to advance further will be revealed from within that means we when you come to goodness the the disorientations because of our worldly desires the disorientation of our inner compass decreases we align more and more with krishna so yes we seek guidance for important decisions and we seek to study scripture under guidance so that we can develop our inner compass does it answer your question okay yes we have time thank you madam yeah yes you ask question you want to have the point of uh, you know the, the child prays like this but then they they leave the room and they have their own ritual experience happen and I was thinking about that and you know, we see that in the lives of like the microcosm of, of the experience of the jiva we see that in the lives of say second generation devotees you know a child is born they're dependent on their parents they don't really make decisions for themselves 
and everything that's coming to them is provided for by their parents and the culture that they're born into. So they create a conscious culture, any other culture. And then there comes a time when they actually, it's necessary to challenge that. It's actually unhealthy not to. One has to assert their independence. And they'll often make a series of bad decisions. And um, some good decisions. And they'll have to come to that realization of what is actually good for them, which hopefully much of what they were given in the beginning was, was, was right. But then they come from dependence to independence, through independence to true balance, to actually choosing. Yeah, I want to, you know, I want to surrender this movement, or I want to embrace the principles that I received early on. Because the jiva, as a, as a microcosm of the jiva's you know, journey, that their dependence on Krishna always, they may have that realization. But Krishna is actually not just appreciating what Krishna is actually asserting or um, also one of the things that the, the child wants to be free. But this is the conditioned soul, by definition, has other desires. And Krishna is also laying those part out. And then acting, not the in between the realization of the spiritual platform and the delivery of material desires, which is really important. I think that was a good one. That's the place where the jiva is actually coming to actually choosing Krishna as a mature part and parcel, saying, you know, I've seen it all. And and I was thinking how the whole body term is actually like a reflection of that. Because it's, you know, like the Maj, it's the part of Maj, falls down from Prima, his whole, uh, his whole thing, of, you know, it's like Krishna's way of helping him play out um, all the way actually his, his irresponsibility to a certain thing, it's what is a deer. And ultimately, all these devotees can't go after him, but he's not on the street. Based on my desire, so whatever I should, I should Choose, you know, choose him as soon as possible. Not just to do it. Yeah, thank you. It's a beautiful reflection that you know, when we have defended this, like our devotee children, they just choose Krishna because their parents are coming to a temple, they come to the temple. Then in adolescence, they become independent and they say, I don't want to choose Krishna. I want to do other things in my life. But then eventually, they have other options that they turn toward Krishna. That's You could call that as interdependence. It's a nice evolution. And how much somebody will assert their independence or how long, that will vary from person to person. But ultimately, we all come to the level where we turn toward Krishna because, as you said, we have seen it all. So now, how much we have to see, how much we have to see so that it is enough for us. That is something which will depend on how seriously we hear about Krishna, how seriously we contemplate our experiences in life. Otherwise, it's, we can never literally say that I have seen it all because there's always something more in the world. But sometimes we get that realize this is enough. Everything else is going to be just more of the same thing. There's no need for that. So, how does that realization come faster? It's difficult to say. Broadly, I've seen three broad factors in that. One is that if we associate with very serious devotees who have a strong desire for Krishna, then that brings that desire for us. And secondly, if we uh, have our illusions exposed before us, that means in a very stark way, that you know, this is what I thought and this is what it is actually. And if at that time, see this is, all our illusions, our illusions are always exposed sometime or the other. But what happens is Maya creates another illusion after that. But if, that's, if we are exposed in such a stark way, that this is how this is. So the association of intense devotees, the exposure of our illusions, not exposure to illusion, but exposure of our illusions. And and finally, some attraction of oneself toward Krishna. Now, both of these might be good. That we have intense devotees, we have serious devotees, we have serious, bad, seriously bad experience of the world. But neither of these will keep us steadily on their own. We need some steady connection, steady attraction to Krishna ourselves. So if we have these three broad things, then it, it's much faster to come back on the right track and stay on that right track toward Krishna. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की श्रील प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त बिंद की गौर प्रेमानंद Yeah. 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 Yeah.